students um, and all the lecturers department of architecture and good morning Philips. Uh, I'm Arina Hayati, the moderator of today's lecturer and I'm very pleased to see you here and welcome all of you tonight in this meeting. And today we have special guest lecturer from Philip Wright, and I'm sure all of us have been waiting for this moment. And thank you very much for your kindness and making time for this lecture. And uh, first of all, I would like to invite uh, our head of architecture department, Budewi Septanti, to have short introduction. Uh, please, Budewi, time is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Bu Arina. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Oh, sorry. First of all, I would like to say thank you to Professor Philip Floride for your time and willingness to share your experience and knowledge with us. Secondly, I also want to thank all participants. I see our guests, uh, our lecturer, and also uh, the student here who have attended this guest lecture. The students who attend this lecture are from undergraduate and postgraduate students, master and doctoral. As you know, today we have a guest lecture from the Department of Art and Design, College of Architecture and Design, Lawrence Un Technical University, Michigan, US, Professor Philip Florey. He also the writer of book Pattern Force and Concept with Framework, The Legend, uh, Big Red Book. Okay, on this occasion, he will discuss the topic about six simple ideas. Hopefully, this topic will be useful for us and will be given beneficial to all of us. That's all from me. Time is back to moderator. Please, Bu Arina. Yeah, thank you very much, Budewi. Uh, Philips is the legend book for us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the red book is our legend books. <laughs> so, um, before, so before we start the lecture, I will read Philip's uh, short biography. Philip Sprite is professor of architectural design and theory at Lawrence Technological University, USA, and chair of the art and depart design department. And he is licensed architect and holds degrees in studio art, architecture, and cognitive linguistics. As an academic researcher and theorist, he is interested in developing clarity around foundational knowledge in the formal design disciplines for use in pedagogical environments. His previous book, uh, Prevailing Architectural Design in 2014, addressed cognitive methodology, while his research manuscript, Qualitative Embodiment in English Architectural Discourse in 2017, look at Latin meaning through conceptual metaphor use in architectural theory. Wow. And in 2020, uh, his recent book, Making Architecture Through Being Human, focused on the application of ideas to produce meaningful spaces that make sense to people. So uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Philip Proright. Time is yours, Philip. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, and it's, it's, it's an honor to be able to talk about some of the stuff that I work on because that's the reason we do this stuff. Um, most, of, most of my own research um, and what I'm interested in is actually ultimately connected to pedagogy. It's about the way we teach people. And so the, the big red book, <laughs> which uh, and I do dislike the cover. The legend um, one. The legend book. You know, I, I wrote that book because I was extremely frustrated with the fact that people kept telling me that we couldn't teach architectural design, yet we constantly had students that we then told that we could teach them, but we didn't know what we would teach in them. And somehow we graduated architects who knew something, but at no point did we ever feel responsible for doing any of that. And that became quite an ethical dilemma for me. It became, it became quite problematic. And so almost all the work I do is really about about addressing and clarifying very fundamental, very, very latent content. I'm, I'm interested ultimately in things that we take for granted and things that we do without thinking. And by bringing awareness to those things, it allows us, it allows us the capacity to have attention on them, to control them, to start to understand how to manipulate them. But ultimately, and I, you know, I've heard this several times that the, um, the, um, the methodology book is actually quite difficult. It's, it's hard to get your head around. And so what I, I want to do today is I want to introduce six ideas and they're going to, they're going to blend between um, the two fields that I work in. I work in cognitive methodology and cognitive semantics. And that you know, sounds complicated, but it's not. It's really, how do we do stuff and what do things mean? And those two things are not the same. 
And that's really, really important to understand that they're not the same. And so I'm going to take you through, I'm going to take you through, and this is about, I think I, I was asked for about 40 minutes. I'm going to try and do it in 40 minutes. Um, I spent a lot of time lecturing, and so we'll see what I can do. First idea, all of your knowledge, everything you know and everything you interpret is based on your body. That's where it all starts. And what does that mean? It means that we ourselves as uh, human organisms on a planet under gravity with daylight is the basis of all meaning in your life. And I don't, I don't mean that casually. I mean, that's what that is the cognitively, that's the foundation of all the thinking structures that we use. And it's also the basis of how we interpret the environment, how we interpret other people, how our language structures operate. And so we have to come back to the body to understand architectural design. We have to start at the body. And the, the, the core of the body is this, is a center. And so I'm gonna introduce two ideas, the center, which is the first, and the center produces a focus, produces a peripheral. And then it also then produces something like a container, an inside and an outside. So I have things that are close to me and I have things that are far away from me. That doesn't seem very complicated, but in the dynamic situations that we work with, and that's what architects do, we work in very, very dynamic situations because we work in social cultural situations. We work with people. That simple idea has some radical effects. And then the next thing is this, this is, a, this is an abstraction of the human body. We have a top and we have a bottom, we have a left, a right, a back and a right. But what's really interesting is qualitatively, we don't treat all these things the same. We actually prioritize some things over others. We actually prioritize ups over downs. We prioritize fronts over backs. And, and for because the, the dominant of the human body is actually right-handed, we dominate right over left. We actually treat those qualitatively very different. And what we do is that we assign good and bad to those axes. And then we use that notion to actually make interpretations. Once we have a front and we have a body, we have an orientation, we actually project an axis from our front forward. And that axis is actually a point of engagement. And it's not real, it's conceptual. But it's, it's real to us because anything our body, how our body projects forward, becomes a site of engagement. And that axis is a really critical tool that we use in design work. So I can take something like an interior like this, which, you know, this won an award, nice space, it's incredible to be in there. How would I design this space? Well, shockingly, this space is designed very, very simply because it involves people. It's designed through an axis and a center. That's it. And so axis produces alignment. It produces, it produces uh, areas of attention. Centers produce areas of static. So an axis is about movement and engagement. A center is about convexity, gathering, right? And, and being together and about community, about interaction. And so when we put just those two really simple ideas together, we can actually, that's all we need to actually produce really incredible architecture to start to, start to build that we layer in materiality, we layer in other, other cultural level stuff as well, but the core of it starts with axes and centers. And then when we talk about movement, very, very interesting things happen between these two ideas. And so depending on say, I wanna move through a space, what we find is that an axis, which is about, about motion and movement and a center, which is about statics and gathering actually interfere with each other. And so if I put an axis through, through a center, I don't have a center anymore. I have two centers because that axis will break that, will break that convexity into two halves. Or if I split it again in, in the image on the bottom, I end up reducing my convexity, my, cent, my circle. I keep reducing it smaller and smaller because that axis is going to start to divide it. And again, these are really, really simple diagrams. But this is the basis of, of spatial planning and spatial organization, which ultimately is about the way that we exist in our environments. We have uh, a lot of other things that actually come from this idea um, of, and this is embodiment. This is the idea that, that our mind and our, our senses and our environments are all interlinked in, interlinked in a feedback loop and that, that they, that's where our meaning comes from. And so when we, when we do stuff, 
we talk about how intuitively we understand how gravity comes to the ground. We understand pressure and weight, right? We expect things to transfer loads. And we can look at something and understand that something will stand up just simply through its formal composition. So the way something is shaped communicates to us how it operates. And there's a set of rules because gravity, gravity is persistent. We don't, we don't get to pretend it's not real. And because of that, it produces a series of formal responses for us that we can interpret persistently. We understand balance weight because of that. So if I wanted to create drama, I can actually produce a building that, that looks unstable or implies a sense of weight. I can have an area of perceived pressure. So if I push a large object down into a void space, we interpret that void space as being under pressure. That's not real. That's actually not true. The air underneath that building is no different from the air outside of that building, but it's about a human, it's about the human interpretation of how um, environmental forces operate within the world. And this is about semantics. This is how we interpret things. We also expect things to move because we move and we transfer our sense of motion to shape. So if we think a shape looks like it's going to move, we give it the ability to move even though it doesn't. And so when we want to create non-static, very dynamic, act active spaces, there's a series of shapes we can use that imply motion. You know, um, Zaha Hadid, you know, spent her entire career with this one idea. How do I produce a building that flows? How do I produce a building that implies motion? This is all used in, in, in you know, these are actually what are called correlational metaphors. They are, there are transfers between the way that we understand our body and the way shapes operate, and that we can have a persistent interpretation of those two things. And coming along with motion, we have action. And we have relationship, we have personifications. We project into buildings our expectations as if those buildings are people. And so two buildings that are pushing into each other necessarily have a relationship because we read those buildings as bodies. And so these are the dancing buildings, right? They are, they are swaying, they are engaged with each other, they are a couple. Again, none of that stuff exists. That's all in your head. But what we have is a shared agreement. And I could put 20 people in a room and we all interpret the building in the same way because it's all based on the same way that, that, our, that our cognition, our thinking operates. And then we build relationships through, and I'm gonna take you back to the center and the peripheral. And so when we have a circle and a center, that's me, I have an edge. When things get too close to me, we are, we are, um, we are set up to pay attention to them. And that's because if we don't pay attention to them, it could be quite risky. And so this sort of thing is very, very deeply embedded within, within our genes. So in the end, these are really, really simple ideas. And these are not methodological ideas. This is not about how we do things. This is, this is about what things mean and why they mean. And they're really, really fundamental, right? And from this, we can actually build up much, much more complex environments. But this stuff is at the core of everything we do within design. So the second idea is this one. Um, architecture design is actually not about buildings, which um, I believe maybe some people could disagree with, but bear with me. What I mean by that is that buildings, built spaces, and environmental design is the outcome of architecture. It is not the basis of architecture. And that's because ultimately architecture is a design discipline and a design discipline, all design disciplines are about making decisions. We manifest different things at the outcome. We have different set of values to what we produce, but they're all based on the fact that we are, what we do is we envision a future condition that does not yet exist. And so nothing we work on actually exists in the world. And how we design that thing is based not on physical objects, but on information. 
And so the basis of architectural design, as is for all design disciplines, is the manipulation, identification, and decision-making focused on information. And so when we start thinking about architectural design as an information discipline, then methodology becomes a lot more understandable because ultimately every bit of information that we collect has to affect a formal decision, which means, and this is a force. And so a non-formal entity that affects a formal response is a force. And so the information that we gather, the things that we pay attention to, the way research operates, the way searching operates, the way context analysis operates, is all about gathering as much information as we can in order to make really good architectural decisions. And so the, in the end, architecture as a design discipline is about the resolution of forces in social cultural environments. So we deal ultimately with people we tend to forget that um, it's it's quite it's quite problematic that ultimately we seem to forget that what we do is about people and not about objects. And so when we get something like sunlight, we think about sunlight about how it starts to shape space. And this is sunlight is a force. Sunlight is actually an idea. And so when we when we look about the angles of light, we talk about summer versus winter winter light. Those, those, are, those are ideas, that's information. And we use that information, we use those angles, we use luminosity and looks and reflection and bounce, all those ideas, we use those to allow us to shape space, to have a particular effect. We can do lots of things. This is if what happens when view and axis come together, right? I have a point where I want to stand and I want to connect. And this is, so this is how axis connects to a focal point that then produce a formal response. So if I'm standing in one location, I have a projection of my body directionality. I want to connect to a focal point and I have an object between me and it. I have to open that object up. That's a force. Again, a very, very simple idea, but with radical effects. Or we can get more complex and we can talk about zoning as forces. We talk about circulation as forces. We can talk about view lines as forces. We can talk about environmental wind as forces and all of those things we can use. And this is a force methodology. This is when we're using a force framework, when we're doing emergent work. All of these, all of these ideas, all of each of these elements, which is a bit of information, allows us to make a formal decision within a builder. And it allows us to make a decision which is defensible because it's connected to reality. It's connected to an experiential effect. So if I put that shape in this place, I rotate it like this, I give that view out, I shelter from this wind, that produces an experiential effect, which is in alignment with the forces in which I'm working with. We can do it also um, in other frameworks as well. And so we can do it in, um, in patterns. And so each of these patterns, there's six patterns here, um, one that has to do with public and private, one about isolation, one about, one about um, volume of spaces, you know, one about topography and elevation, um, one about view, and the other, one, the other one about culture. Each of those operates as a force, and when we put them together, we, we produce a response. We can, and we can do it also, and this, is, this one is a concept framework. And these are a lot of the images I'm showing you. In fact, almost most of everything from here on are actually projects that have done under my direction, uh, things I've done with students, um, where we've applied the same, the same things that you're studying. Um, and so this is a concept framework. In this case, the force is about motion. And the this is using also using extrapolation. So the motion is about the constant movement of the human body and how to produce a space where the human body never stops moving. You get you get a response. There's a whole there's a series of other layers and there's a narrative that's connected to it. So this was a competition based work, um, and and so the even a concept based framework uses uses forces to create the resolution. The difference is that concept tends to eliminate or narrow. It be, they become very, very narrow, and they're they're usually um, they're usually a little polemic, polemical. They're there to create some sort of um, some sort of attention or focus. 
ultimately we have you know we have a whole series of of forces that we operate and we have to we actually have to think about these forces as types of information and we have environmental forces we have sensory motor forces we have social forces we have cultural forces each one of those is we if we don't think about it as information and we don't think about how that information then affects a formal response we have a really hard time resolving our architectural design and this gives us a, this actually gives us a lot of access um, to really really good decision making it gives us a lot of clarity in the ability to communicate things to other people as well third idea meaning and content are not the same thing and i've been talking about both meaning and um, methodology um, up to this point but a design method and the type of content that goes into a design method are actually separate. Certain methods will allow us to do certain things. There's a bias within methods, but I can use the same method. I can change the information in that method. I will get radically different projects. And this is the complexity and maybe the struggle that people have with some of the, some of the especially in the Revealing Architectural Design book, there is, there is you, we have to start thinking hierarchically. So there's, there's several different hierarchies of activities in the way that we do design. I can produce a framework. I can use exactly the same framework for 20 different projects. I can vary the type of information and my focus, and I will have 20 radically different projects that look really, really different. And it's very hard for us to look at, to look at the visuals and connect the visuals to ideas behind those visuals. We actually separate those two things in our heads. So a project that looks different has to have a different approach to doing it. No, it doesn't. It's about the way information is manipulated within the design process. So a, um, I can take any of these things. I'm, so I'm gonna show you three projects and these are, these are weirdly architecture. These are very, these are foundation. These are first year projects. This is a stare for an animal. Fine. This is a four space framework. And so we, we do this through, um, through um, we teach research first. That's the first thing we do. We teach how to, how to collect information, how to set up priorities of information. And so this process was one where the animal would be studied, the steer would be studied, and those things were brought together. And so we have a rabbit, we have a frog. Um, we actually have two frogs. And so a rabbit and two frogs, which are each of those are, are really different inputs of information. And from that, we have this methodology. This is a standard, this is a standard um, force-based methodology where it's running three different lines of information. It wants to look at the animal physical information. It wants to look at the animal sensory information and its context. And it wants to look at an abstraction of a steer. So what is, what is the nature of a steer? What are all the elements? What do all those things do? It runs, those are three different groups of information. And from that, you would select what the most important element is, use that to explore your variations, to run your iterations, and then start to fold in the secondary and tertiary information to get, to get a project. That's a standard force process, which is, which is um, always emergent, always starts with bits and little bits of information and then aggregates those bits of information together to produce a project. And so in this case, this is, I'll take one of these projects and say, okay, let's, let's, this is all information, right? This is all information about how the frog operates. This is the physiology of the frog. We also can talk about its behavior and its environment. We can, um, we can look at um, what, the, um, what the sensory information is within the frog itself. So how does it see, how does it hear, what's its sense of smell? Because these are all ways that we engage and we, and we should produce environments that respond to particular sensory information so that people can engage them properly. We can also do abstractions uh, of the stairs. So we can talk about how the stair operates and what the elements of the stair and what makes a stair a stair. So these are core, these are one of the core tools that we use in all design practices is abstraction, this ability to move from the object to the events that are, take place around the object. So we talk about how things work, not just simply what something looks like. And from that, we could end up, we end up with a series of iterations and explorations that then in this case, the priority information was about safety and predators. So how do we produce a set of stairs 
for something that's not us, that has a different set of requirements where its survival is the most critical aspect of the design process. That produces this the series of iterations. And ultimately, when we get to, when we get to a, a quick final project, this is a set of stairs that is for a frog. Well, interestingly enough, I'm gonna show you three more projects. Um, this is a theater, these are three projects by three different people of a theater complex that uses exactly the same methodology. Radically different building uh, projects, radically different outcomes, even all three of these outcomes are different, but it uses exactly the same methodology. And so we can go back and I'll take, this is the animal steer methodology, just to remind you, we start with, we start with three lines of investigation. We start to pull out the critical aspects from one of one of those two, and it's about the animal. We pull out something that's critical about that animal, right? We start to then explore the possibilities, and then we fold in the other two lines of information to make sure that everything in the project works well. Here is the theater project. There's the methodology. Look what's changed. The only thing that's changed is the type of information that goes into the project. So we go from animal physical information to site analysis. We go from animal sensory information to um, program analysis. And then we have a social cultural analysis. But everything else, the same process we go through, this is a standard, a standard force-based ideation process. We go through exactly the same process. We end up with radically different projects. So instead of a stair for a frog, I end up with a theater building on a, on a, on a river edge where this is, this is a site analysis. This is using forces to do site analysis. So it's looking at sun issues, circulation issues, points of mass in, point of cultural flows, visibilities, things like that, noise pollution. Those, each one of those is, is a type of information that we use to then make decisions about where that project should be cited based on assets and constraints. Whether, whether if I put it in this location, there's too much noise. If I put it in that location, it's too far away from circulation. And as we, as we go through that, we do, we do um, program analysis. And this is, this is actually a force-based program analysis that looks at the relationship between types of occupation. So what events are taking place in space? This is done through what's called event affinity. So what, what spaces need to be connected to what other spaces? What spaces need to be pulled away from other spaces? That process was the same thing that we did within, within the Frog Project. So if I have a frog in this location, should it be next to this? Should it be further away than this? How does sun operate on it? What is the visibility of the predator to the frog? That's all information that we use to create a shape. And that shape then contains a body. And the final project that we end up with, you know, um, is, is this one, which is one of several that work. They're all successful. Um, because the outcomes are all different because the type of focus and the type of information that was introduced into the methodology was different. But it doesn't mean the methodology um, has to be radically new for every single project. The other thing that I, I think people struggle with is that the visualization of something and the methods that we use are actually not connected. And so I think you'll know this from doing, uh, when we do typology and pattern base, that patterns, um, develop essential relationships between formal compositions that embed social information. It doesn't embed aesthetic or visual information. And so I can make, I can make um, a successful pattern look very, very traditional. I can make it look really, really radical. And that's just a choice of materiality and final, final uh, styling and composition, but it doesn't change the pattern. And so we have to understand that what something looks like and how we make something are actually separate. If I show you three buildings and you'll tell me that all three of these buildings are radically different buildings, that they're the designers from Rem Koolhouse over to Utsun, that these are, these, are, these are really, these have to be produced by very, very different outcomes. And my response is no, actually all three of these projects are done using a force-based uh, methodology that prioritizes um, program and occupancy over everything else. And so the Valet Le Duc wrote this, as you may know from the book, this is the classic architecture, this is classic force-based architecture method. 
Rem Koolhaas uses exactly the same method as Valet le Duc. His buildings don't look anything like 19th century French chateaus. It doesn't matter because the, method, the decision making process is the same. He identifies um, types of activities in space. He prioritizes those activities to certain types of forces, mostly adjacency and view. Right? They look at the affinities of what spaces should be next to each other and which ones should be passed, pulled apart, and then they clad the building. Right? Valet Le Duc uses exactly the same process. It's constrained by some more cultural expectations, and that's the difference. But the, the process of going through the design is exactly the same. The decision making is exactly the same. And we have the same, Ulsen said the same thing when he built his Khan Lee's house where it was like, how does light come in? Where do I sit? What do I see? Those are all environmental and social forces that are then used to shape, to shape the spaces. All right, number four, all meaning is based on context. You cannot produce meaning if you don't have a context, which means when you produce an object that's floating in space with nothing around it, you actually can't determine what that thing means. And this comes back to, uh, this comes back, this is another discussion about semantics. The last one was about, number three was about methodology. Number four is about semantics. This is how we produce meaning. That, that meaning is based on these really, really basic elements that, uh, that I've been talking about. So uh, axis, center, adjacency, visibility, exposure. These are really, really fundamental ideas that we use in architectural design to, to do the core. We use them in everything. It doesn't matter what methodology. And so I can take something really, uh, you know, really basic. This is National Assembly in Kuwait. This is an Utsun building. And I, and I don't want to look at the building because I'm going to do a bunch of really bad Photoshop work because it took me five seconds to do each of these quickly. But what I want to show is this. We think something big is really important. And the answer is yes. Most of the time, a big thing is important. So if we want to bring attention to a building, we make that building big, right? That's what we do. Um, we also do the same way if we repeat something a few times, it means that we should pay attention to it. So when we take a look at the facade of this, there's, it expresses outwards, it reinforces the street wall, it expresses itself to draw our attention to it. It, repeated, it repeats the same element several times. And that catches our eye. That means that we want to look at this thing. But I can make a series of changes to this image and understand that, you know, yes, this is an image that I'm changing, but I want to talk about this as a four dimensional space. And so if I do something and I make a change, I can make this even more important by changing its relationship to my body and making it, um, making it proximity closer that makes it more important and I pay attention. So all of a sudden now this facade becomes even more important just by creating a small change of visibility and proximity. But I can also do something else. I can make it, um, I can make it also less important, right? By some of the changes I make. I can, um, I can introduce a ground. I can decrease the importance of, of, that, of that facade by changing the way ground operates. I can actually change its attention. I can introduce new elements that again, because I'm, I'm doing similarity, I'm using the same colors and same sort of material, material. It actually decreases the importance of that facade. I can do something where I produce repetition, where repetition means mostly pay attention. If I repeat it too much, it means don't pay attention. And so we have a rule that now works against itself. So if I repeat something too many times, it becomes background. And so now I have something that in the very first image you were supposed to pay attention to. In this image, I'm telling you not to pay attention to it. Big is always important, no. Big is almost always important, but small can also be important depending on how I frame it. And so if I introduce something small, in ground, something where that once was pay attention to me, now it's background, I can make that small thing really important. Or I can make that small thing be self-referential. I can use a circle. I can use convexity to say, okay, this is self-contained. This tree is about itself and not about the space around it. Or I can bring attention to it by bringing an axis in and saying that tree extends and connects to something else. So the circle, connects to itself, the axis connects to something else. 
or I can make something even smaller, more important, by producing an axis and producing difference, changing its scale, um, and offsetting it from another object. Now all of a sudden, I have I have something even smaller as the focal point within a composition. So that's really difficult for us to get our heads around that we have a set of rules that don't work all the time. That most of the stuff we deal with in dynamic situations have to do with probabilities. And so is big important? Yes, most of the time, unless I do something like this or something like this or something like that. The thing for us as designers, which is fantastic, is that these things are not unpredictable. I understand how axes work. I understand how centrality work. I understand how repetition works. I understand how attention and proximity work. And now it's a case of arranging those within space to make those spaces and those forms do what I want them to do. Because while we work in probabilities, those probabilities are, we build those probabilities yeah. into, into larger contexts. All right. Idea number five. Not everything you think matters, matters. And so not all ideas in design are usable. In fact, uh, there's an awful lot of stuff that isn't usable. And we have to understand what is architectural and what is non-architectural. If we try to do a project with non-architectural ideas, the project will fail. And so we always have to translate those ideas into architectural effects. And this is where forces become really, really critical because the major way that architecture is resolved is through forces. And I don't care if you're doing pattern or force-based or concept-based work, they all use forces. They use them in different ways though. So where a force, a force framework is an emergent framework that uses the forces raw, it usually it builds from small pieces into larger project. Pattern framework uses codified forces. So a force which is successful gets used, um, gets, gets codified, gets it's fixed, and then gets reproduced in space, reformed in space, but it's still based on the initial forces. Concept framework uses forces as well. They tend to often be focused on social cultural forces rather than um, sensory motor, social environmental forces. It, they also tend to uh, introduce some really heavy filters that ignore a lot of things. And that's where they become, to me, concept is a very advanced process. It's the last thing I generally teach students is concept because you need to know patterns and, and forces before you do that. The problem we have is when we start dealing with cultural stuff is that um, cultural information is often really, really difficult to translate. And so what we, what we actually do um, we actually use what's called similarity metaphors to do, to do these translations. And that is a way of connecting information from one domain of knowledge to another domain of knowledge. And we have, we have two types of similarity um, metaphors. And the first one's a visual metaphor, an image metaphor. And these are easy. These are, these are probably, this is the knee jerk reaction. Everybody knows how to do this. We make one thing look like something else. Um, and the, the issue with that is that, um, it's, they're not actually always that deep. Um, and often designers forget to fold in all the rest of the information that matters, how this thing gets used and where it's situated and you know, how, it, how, it, how it engages the environment, which then uses all of that foundational force-based information. There are, there are sometimes a lot of advantages to, to why we do this, um, but we also have to understand that sometimes this, this visual information is culturally and socially constructed, which means it's got a limited lifespan. So if we're going to make a building, in the case, this is a Zev Hecker building, which is famous for being like the spirals of a sunflower. And this is a very, this is a classic image metaphorical transfer. In this case, it goes from a sunflower as an object into the, into the building as a plan. Um, and it's what we do is that we translate that shape to another shape. We take it from a shape from nature to a shape in, in human construction. The question we always, always, always have to ask ourselves is one of relevance. Why should we make the plan look like a sunflower? There has to be some advantage to us because ultimately it's not a sunflower and it's not about a sunflower. And in fact, we never actually experienced the plan from, from the bird's eye view. Well, the image that I showed you is never how humans actually understand that space. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're using an image metaphor, 
why are we using that image metaphor? What advantage does it give us? What, what edge does it give us in the design work? It's not a casual question. You actually have to be able to defend that. And the problem is, is that when you don't, you end up with buildings that look like this, which is purely a cultural representation. And it wouldn't shock anybody to find out that what happened in this building was the Ministry of, of Fish. And it's a fish baked building. Very, very superficial. Um, and then my question would be one of spatial quality, which is what architecture does. There's another type of um, there's another type of similarity metaphor which becomes really uh, more relevant, uh, but it's a lot more difficult to do. And that's that's a relational metaphor, and that's when we take how things work and transfer it to how buildings work. So the image you see below is actually a relational metaphor that has to do with mangrove swamps and how the mangrove and the water operate together. Where a building that doesn't look like a tree works in the same way in the way that the foundations operate, the way it filters water, the way it's, sit, it's situated within the relationship between the ground and the, and the land. And so it operates in the same way as a mangrove uh, forest, but it doesn't have to look like a mangrove forest. We have a lot of difficulty sometimes with these because the metaphor actually disappears. We use it in a design method. We don't use it in a visualization. And um, we have to let go of those things. We have to learn how to let go of those things. So these, these types of relational metaphors are actually quite important because they allow us to take relationships between things and map them from one to another. So a, a project which is about radar is actually not about the way the radar looks. It's about the identification of objects within plan at distances away from us for proximity relationships. We can do projects about sunflowers that don't look like sunflowers because what we can talk about is the heliotropic nature of a sunflower and how it tracks the sun across a day. And then we can, we can transfer that to a planned situation where we say, okay, we can start to encapsulate certain types of occupations and certain types of events across a day. And we can track those across time so that the building, although it doesn't move, works in the same way that a sunflower works. It doesn't look like a sunflower. Or we can talk about a building which is a bird's nest and it doesn't have to look like a bird's nest. But what we can talk about are these environmental and these sensory motor information. These are all forces, vista, elevation, panorama, um, exposure, convexity, refuge. Those are all forces. How do we translate? How do we package those forces? Those are the forces that are connected to a bird's nest. How do I take those forces and I transfer them to a building, right? We would run this, we could run, um, we would start with a concept. The concept is the bird's nest. We would then immediately move into a, a sub methodology that looks at forces and say, okay, which, which ones do I have? And how, how would I then distribute those forces within a new site condition? We would end up with a building that might actually look like this, right? Which is about exposure. This is about a situation, its relationship to the ground. It's about vista, it's about secludedness. And so it encapsulates the, the relational metaphors of the bird's nest without having to look like the bird's nest. The other thing to remember is that just because you have a good idea, it, it may not work and you have to let go of it. Um, you have to go through the process of translation. You have to look at issues of relevance. And if the idea doesn't matter, you have to find a different idea. Um, they're not, they don't all, they don't all translate. And a lot of, a lot of the cultural information we deal with doesn't translate well into formal composition. And this is my last, and this one will be um, fairly quick. And it's, it's tied into one of the, er one of the other earlier ideas. And it's where you start a project controls where you end a project. And so the decision-making you make in the very, very first pass, usually in the very, you know, by what, what framework you choose, how you approach your information and what type of information you think is important dictates where the project concludes. And so different starting points with the same project, with the same client, on the same site, with the same users, everything's exactly the same. The selection of the information where you start will radically change where it ends. So all the projects on the screen that you see are actually all the same project. They just chose different starting points. And then they organize their information in different ways. These are actually all concept-based um, uh, projects that are working on um, visions, future visions of housing. So if I took 
I'm going to run you through a series of, of projects where I'm just going to show you where the starting points were and how they became quite different. And so this is this is the um, this is the program relationship. Um, different types of human events in space with different volumes of spaces given to them. And then on the on the left side, those are the forces that we're using. And so I can take a project like this, and this one prioritized exposure, privacy, and communality. And so you can see the decisions that were made within the spaces prioritize those types of information. So it was very much concerned about how things were exposed and where privacy was creation was created. These are all using exactly the same program. Um, they're independent to site. I wanted to make this simpler. And so we've we've separated it from site just to understand the internal relationships between a building. If I did the same project and I looked at visibility and procession, so circulation, rather than containment, I get one that prioritizes movement over static. Right? And so this project is now driven through the way we move through the building and arranges the volumes of space accordingly. I can do it again with one that looks at procession but stresses privacy rather than visibility. And so with this one, this project was about exposure and visibility. This project was about privacy. So what we get is that we get from an external circulation piece, we internalize the circulation piece now. We can do it again when we, this is uh, using, this is actually using some patterns um, and it looks at connectedness. So different ways, different formal compositions, a series of iterations of those compositions, and then a, a set of how different shapes can connect together in the same way to produce an outcome. But instead of looking at visibility or circulation, it really wants to understand how those spaces are connected to each other. You do it again, we're doing exposure again and containment, but we're using sound. So we're really prioritizing the idea of sound over sight. What happens? We produce a different building. This one now has a series of layers that are there to mitigate, block and reflect sound. Those wouldn't exist in the one that prioritizes sight because the information is different. If I, if I want to look at presence and broadcast, we take a look in the middle, take a look at that one that says viewing. All of a sudden we have, we have, a, we have a soft center of this building and the, everything's arranged so that we prioritize a very, very large void that is about the expression of this building outwards. Now that's exposure, presence and communality. But if I work with privacy instead with the same ideas, I actually have a building that then turns inwards on itself. Or, one that has to do with connectedness and visibility. So it's, you know, we're, I mean, in the end, the, the point, you know, that I'm trying to make is a lot of what we do is actually quite simple, um, but we work in dynamic situations that make things look really, really complicated. We ultimately, we have to pay attention to the information we're using and we have to understand how to, how to manipulate that information we start with really, really simple things that we start with the body. We're, we're going to start to deal with much, much more complex things. We also, I think, fundamentally have to understand what is, what is our responsibility, what's architectural, and what isn't our responsibility. Um, and especially when we start dealing with a lot of social political issues, we may find that some of the social political issues that you really, really care about, if they can't be formalized, then they're not architectural. You either have to find a way to formalize it, you have to find a, a way to get into those conversations, or you have to let go of them because they're, they're not about what we actually do. They don't have the capacity to be expressed within architectural ideas. And then I'll, I'll end on, you know, obviously this, which is the last two major books that I did. And, and just to actually, this whole conversation today is really being about like these two things. One is about how we do things, which is you know the revealing architectural design. And then the one I just published last year, which is about cognitive semantics, which are a series of really, really simple tools that we use in thinking to actually make spaces make meaning. I want to thank everybody. It was um it's been it's been fantastic to be invited and to talk to all of you. I promised I promised a 40 minute talk so enough time for some conversation and I'm just a little bit over if that's okay. Thank you very much Philips for your uh, presentation. It's uh, really valuable for us. So it's very informative and interesting presentation and one point that I can highlight 
our when we are designing architecture, we can start from us, right? From ourselves around yeah. our environment that have sometimes strong arguments. But uh, sometimes we start from two metaphoric ideas that sometimes are doable. So um, we have uh, many questions here in the chat box, <laughs> for sure. But uh, some of us, uh, some of them uh, in Indonesian, but uh, some of them uh, in English. But uh, I would like to uh, propose uh, students, participants to have three questions that you can raise your hand and asking question to Philip directly. So please. Anyone participant that want to ask question directly to Philip? And I'm okay. If you want to read, if you want to read something from, it's fine. Sorry, did somebody just start talking? Okay, okay. So I will read one of them. Uh, wait, it's from Samson. You know. Oh, there is one one student book. Which one? Uh, uh, Shahrul Haj. Shahrul Haj. Okay. He's raising his hand. Oh, okay. Shahrul, okay. Please. You can ask question directly. Is it mute? Is it mute? Yeah. Yeah, I need to look. Ah. Remember when we used to sit in an audience hall and people would like look at you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It was so nice. Thank you, Mr. Philip. Uh, I want to ask uh, about, uh, you said uh, about the architecture is not about uh, something must be built or your idea. Oh, no. I think the connection think is so. Yeah. yeah. It's all right. We'll wait. I, it's okay. <laughs> we can move to the next um, student. We can come back. Yeah, <laughs> he can come back. Okay, so I will. I will read, uh, or maybe uh, Samson, you can ask your question directly to Philip. Me, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. First, I will try to thank you for this uh, chance to uh, to ask. Uh, I want to ask about slum and squatters. So uh, mm. recently, we were given an assignment to review slums and squatters. From reading and watching the video that were given to us, I was asking. Uh, I'm asking myself that: uh, Do we re do we really need standards or framework or design in that architecture itself? Because when I see squatters or slum, they they didn't use any of uh, what we were learning all this time. They just make do with what what they have. Like uh, if they can improve something, they will. Like uh, uh, they start with zero. Uh, at zero, uh, and maybe if they have some uh, some materials, they improve their. Uh, yeah. They make kitchen, they make living room, and adding things to as time goes goes on. Uh, and also uh, about point six that you say that the starting point is also the end point. No, but, I didn't say it is oh, the end. I said it controls the end. It controls the end. I'm sorry. Yes. But looking at the slums or squatters, uh, those people never never thinks of the end point they That's just think, right. they just think of uh i'm going to live better so i will going to add more and more and more and mm. there's actually no end point so i was uh, uh by my uh, i'm sorry if my no, it's good i know i know what you're asking and it's really I, really interesting okay so here's here's the thing design is a natural human condition everybody in the world designs everyone because it's what makes people people when i get up in the morning and i get dressed that's an act of design i think about my day i think about who i'm going to meet what context i'm going to be in i select clothing that's appropriate to that in those interactions those are decision makers i make a decision i make a series of decisions i don't even think about it i make a whole series of decisions those are all design acts what you're talking about is two different things you're talking about what does it mean for somebody to occupy space when squatters build a house, they use the same factors that you use to do design work, but you're a professional designer, which is very, very different to being a casual or an amateur designer. You actually have to have much more awareness of these things. But if I was going to build a house or a shelter for myself, what do I deal with? Convexity, privacy, 
centrality, edge condition, axis, they're all the same things. I think about how I produce shelter. I think about, I think about how the rain comes down and I produce a roof that then makes the rain come off my roof. That's a force, right? If I, if I produce the roof that let rain in, would I change it? Probably. Would I think about it? No, I would just try to stop the water from coming in. And so you're talking about two really, really different things. You're talking about the Haddock development of formal composition, which is what everybody can do. I mean, you have people build their own houses. Are they architects? No, because they're, they're not thinking at a professional level about the, the more complex arrangements of spaces and the idea the ideas of, um, of occupations and experience. But the other thing they're not doing is that they're not designing for somebody who's not them. And that's, that's what makes you a professional designer. You don't produce projects for yourself. You always produce projects based on empathy for somebody who is not you, right? One of the things that we like to do, we actually like to use non-human things because that's we actually have to start to understand um, the way something else operates sensorily. Like what, what are their embedded, embedded interpretations of the environment, which are actually different to human ones. But for you, you have to then reflect back on your own, your own embeddedness, your own, your own sense of these capacities as a professional designer. But I will guarantee you, and I can do this, I'm actually working, I'm working with a PhD student right now at Arizona State who's looking at um, refugee settlements. We're using social spatial analysis, which is based on a lot of stuff that I've told you, to analyze how those haddock spaces operate, and they operate in the same way. You can you can create uh, convexities, points of points of movement, points of circulation, points of force resolution that have to do with environments. They work on visibility, exposure, privacy. They work in issues of wind and rain and topography. Those are all forces, right? So, so my, you know, my response is that the people who are building slums are actually using exactly the same decision-making process that you use as a professional designer, but they're not thinking about it because they don't have to because it's internalized. They're doing it for themselves and they're making decisions in situ. They're, they're deciding where something goes. And so they're working in a one-to-one -one relationship. We as architects hardly ever do that. We actually always have a separation between what we design and then how it manifests in the world. And that's why we work through tools. We work through drawings and models and VR and movies and whatever else we work in to describe what should happen. But we don't physically put those buildings up, right? We don't make decisions in, in the process. We actually have to make all the decisions ahead of time. But welcome to being human, <laughs> what it is. Thank you, sir. That's a great, it's a great question and thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, I think what uh, some some question is related to our condition, uh, Philips, that we are surrounded by very complex environments, social yeah. condition, economic, and something like that. So that's why uh, it's common for our students to propose uh, the problem, the design problem, based on the social, political, and environmental issue. So yeah. Yeah, but you know, um, policy, zoning. Yeah codes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, anything to do with political resolutions, those are all forces. Yes. So anything that has a formal effect can be understood as, as a force. I know, I know mm -hmm. architects who really, really believe in this stuff who don't practice architecture anymore. They, they went into government mm -hmm. and they use what they know about, about environmental design to make good policy because the mm -hmm. policy affects the way the form manifests. Yes, are they still right. architects? Mm. Well, they're still dealing with the same type of information. They still have the same focus. So to me, they still, they're still working in architecture. They're just not designing buildings. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I think Hutz uh, is here now. Uh, Hutz? I think he has a, a, a bad connection book. And she oh, okay, right. so we can okay, move so, on to uh, next. Uh, Rizal. Yeah. Yeah. Rizal, you can ask a question. Okay, thank you very much for uh, having me uh, asking for questions. My name is Rezal. I'm the uh, last year in undergraduate students. Uh, my question is about maybe quite relevant with the previous uh, questions and then you answer it. Uh, but what I want to ask is about uh, most of designer, uh, they didn't realize what they have been doing is about this, uh, I'm going to uh, make the frame uh, force-based 
the first place and then i want to uh, highlight the maybe i want to highlight the uh movement or something like that but my question is uh, what is the importance of the designers uh, to understand and realize the importance of understanding what they are going to design because this is maybe some uh, question uh, from uh, our uh, the, the, the students most of students when we, we are needing uh, we are have to make when we have to make uh, something just like uh, says on your uh, holy red book uh, <laughs> and we are asking why we need to holy red uh, book. okay yeah <laughs> yeah this question i hope you can uh, take it <laughs> i think the highlight is uh, he is asking whether um, what is the uh, in the practice sh they should use this kind of process the framework yeah yeah yeah, yeah so um I'll give you I'll give you an economic answer. When you understand, I, I, I watch a lot of architects fumble around and spend a massive amount of time doing early design concepts without really understanding the client, the site or a lot of other things. It's about efficiency. Ultimately, methodology is about efficiency. If I want to get a certain type of response, I choose the right steps to get me to that response and what what having access to that process allows you to do is actually to innovate it allows you it allows the project to be stronger it allows you to really have clarity over the type of information and the decisions that you make but it's also faster right because you're not confused you're not guessing, you're not trying, you're not stumbling around, you're not having some metaphysical angst about, oh, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And it's like, the projects I showed you are done in two to three weeks, not 15. Because here, collect this information, study this, pull in this information, give me analysis of the site, show me where the wind is, show me where the rain is, show me how you're gonna to respond to that. Where is visibility? How should this thing express itself? What, is the, what does the community want? Click, 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 click. Here's an option, here's an option, here's an option, here's an option. They all work. Select which one you want. That one, develop it, done. Professionally, I am fed up of architects being the least paid and underpaid professionals that we have because we don't know what we're doing. That's the quick answer. Well, <laughs> that's a good answer for me. I'm satisfied. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, we have um, still four students <laughs> raise their hands. But, uh, yeah. well, it's early. Look, it's early morning for me, and I'm just going for a run. So Is it, I have time. Okay, Philips. <laughs> we, we promise to you that uh, we will done for two hours, but um, I think we can. Okay. Yeah, we, okay. Thank you very much. So um, I will ask uh, Lalu. I think uh, Lalu, you have. Any yeah. question? Yeah. Kalau nanya pakai bahasa Indonesia aja nggak mau Saya yang ngerasa. Nope. Uh, <laughs> saya ngerasa. You can, you can ask in, in English. Nanti Bu Arina <laughs> lebih bagus untuk dalam bahasa ini. No, 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 no. You have to try, right, Philips? <laughs> you should hear so, me speak French. It's horrible. You bump up, man. Send a bump on. I'll try. Um, so, I'm. I'm interested in your uh, proposal, uh, proposition about architecture is about the information and the building itself is about the result or the end product of architecture. Uh, when I think about that, uh, I agree. I, I, I'm really agree with you how information is what build architecture, but um, in the end, what makes architecture is human and when there's human, there's always an ego, there is always uh, yeah. things that are driven by emotion and things like that. Uh, where's the stand for ego in that information? Is that is ego even possible to be uh, when yeah. it's infused in information into the architecture? Of course, uh, <laughs> of course, you know, of course. Um, you know, the, Ego is going to be present in everything. And we're always going to think that we've got the best ideas and everybody else sucks. That's what we do. That's human. Um, 
when when though when we work in a professional environment and i you know um and our industry is more and more people don't work by themselves projects have to have the project life has to be independent to the ego of the designer we have um historically we have a really we have a lot of baggage that comes from um western from western development and western uh, philosophy that produces this genius idea and we have this weird connection between architecture and fine arts that architecture is a type of creative expression and it's created by an individual who's brilliant and can do amazing things that nobody else can do which is not true it's a fallacy uh, and it it has a long historical legacy um that and it's very deeply embedded within the society and i mean part of my own part of my own work is to separate design from art they're not the same function methodologically and intellectually and cognitively they don't operate in the same way at all and so i think for you as designers understanding that you actually have to suppress your ego you have to practice and what i think is that when you start dealing with things like relevancy of information you're still going to have individual decision making you're going to say okay you know we actually make when we do data collection we pull in a lot of information we actually make a lot of decisions based on what we think are interesting or where we think we have a possibility of an entry and so those examples of all these different projects i showed you from working on exactly the same methodology those are because individual designers said i think that matters more than that that's not it that doesn't have to be an ego discussion though but it's still based on the way that you see the world and you have the responsibility then to make that idea relevant and ultimately i think i'd like to flip right it's not about your ego it's about your responsibility and so you you actually have to think like when you do something it better work because you're responsible for the pleasure and the enjoyment and the, and the you know and the refinement of a space for somebody who's not you and so one of the things that drives me crazy in the way that you know sometimes we work and this is i've done this myself where i've spent I've spent a lot of time talking a client into something they should do and all this and I do this building and then I walk away and I never see the building again. Where should my ego be in that conversation? Right? Why do I think I know how somebody else should live in a space that's not for me? And so really what I'm asking you is then like suppress the ego, talk about your responsibility and talk about what empathy means within a design situation. and empathy is about information empathy is about what i pay attention to right uh, so so there is a uh, second question and it's uh outside of what you're discussing right now because it's about <laughs> your book uh, in the methodology of architecture yeah um i was discussing for almost a year, a year maybe with bu arina about this line in your book about refine in the concept framework so the, the so in, in your framework there is concept uh, hypothesis refine and then there's a, a dot line and then there's mapping and then uh, 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 analyze purpose and, and design so um in your book if I, if i remember correctly uh, you said that if it should be refined then refine it if it's not then go to mapping And then my question is what do you mean when you say that you have to refine okay. the hypothesis about the, the, uh, in my in my, in my opinion the hypothesis itself is the refinement of the context so what what else should, should i refine that, that's my <laughs> that's my dilemma when i doing my uh, final you know, uh, project yeah so it comes down to like, when when we use a concept framework we we can either select Um I think the key is to understand that certain things are inside architectural knowledge and some things are outside of architectural knowledge and I think so we've worked for a long time um culturally within architecture to deny that architecture has a boundary we actually think that architecture is about everything and that's not it's actually not true and so you have to there's there's very particular content and any so it comes down to um formal um formal manipulation of a landscape right so if we can if we can put an object in space with a body that can become architectural if you have an idea that that doesn't directly relate to those types of forces you have to translate it which is that means it's a metaphor right and there's 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 you know there's three major there's three major types of metaphor which I, you know most people don't seem to understand this either 
and you you would translate image differently than you would take translate relational. So that's one thing. If you're working within architecture, um, you know, you still have to refine, you still have to refine that process. So it's, you know, the what concept does is that it limits, it limits a, uh, your early decision making. It, it cuts a whole bunch of stuff out, but it doesn't eliminate it. So really, really good concept work. And this is why it's, to me, it's very advanced. You have to have a lot of sophistication. You have, a lot, you have to have a lot of background knowledge, new concept very well, because you can set up a position, even if it's within architectural content. So it has something to do with environmental forces. It has something to do with, with bodies and positionings, or it's something to do with a sight line or prominence or something. You still then have to go into a secondary level of refinement that says, okay, how do I start to connect everything else to this one idea? How do I connect circulation to it? How do I connect visibility to it? How do I connect daylight to it? How, how do I connect mass in and, and presence to it? How does all that stuff, how does that one concept, the refinement is then the secondary, the secondary forces that are becoming into alignment with that concept. So I, I guess I understand your book wrong, I guess. <laughs> I no, know. I think. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. so. It's my fault. Because, I didn't write the it how, The how to process that you, say, you just said is uh, worse. Uh, I, uh, uh, I put it on the mapping, the, not on the refinement. So I think, yeah, there, there's shift. And Look, um, here's the thing. The thing to remember is frameworks are really, really large scale. Mm. The really big, large scale orientational uh, approaches. Okay. There's lots of ways. There's lots of different ways to change the pieces to make it work. As long as you, as long as you stay within the large scale. So the core of framework is that you use you use, you use a, an overriding idea, it's top down. You use a row overriding idea to organize all of the elements. And so it's a coherence-based approach, which is really, really different to a force-based approach, which is aggregate, which is parametric, where a lot of lots of little, so I don't know what the end is before I start when I do forces. And concept, I know, I, you know, I have a thing big about, idea. yeah, I have a big idea. Mm -hmm. I have to decide if that big idea is relevant or not. And to make it relevant, I actually have to now, what I use is that big idea and I say, okay, this is really going to be about this, 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 uh, you know, and it's, I really want to deal with materiality and cultural presence because that's what that idea is about. I still have to work out circulation. I still have to work out visibility. I still have to work out prominence. I still have to set up my axial relationships. I still have to integrate it into context, right? The idea needs to help me do that. If it doesn't help me do that, then it's the wrong idea. But when we do design work, we work with, this is the problem. And the funny, anybody watch football? You guys, I'm a Liverpool fan, huge. Anybody, and so Americans call it soccer. I'm English, I call it football. Yeah. Right? I, and this is weird, but this is how I actually think about design as well. And so I'm looking, I watch football and I, I'm really, I coach and I'm really interested in the way that that operates. And a soccer game, a football game is a dynamic, situation with humans. It's a design situation where we don't know there's non-predictable outcomes. And so how do we train? How, how is it possible to have any methods within football when we have dynamic situations and we don't know what the outcomes are? What's well, really simple, we have two organizational structures. We do a whole bunch of skill training. We understand how to use a ball. We have small techniques. We have small methods that we use. I, I know how to guard the ball. I have passing techniques. I have attacking techniques. I have striking techniques. I have all of those things that we train individually. And then we have a superstructure, which is team organization, right? I have a defensive team. I have a, I have a gen gen attacking team. I have, I have some philosophy to how my team approaches. And when those two things come together, they produce a dynamic game in the middle. Design works in exactly the same way. We have a whole series of small techniques we use to study information, to make decisions. We have ways that visibility work and procession and all these things work. We have large scale uh, infrastructures that talk about the large scale approach. Am I going to select a top down approach that I really want to have a major idea and use that idea to organize all my information. I want to allow the approach to come dynamically and I'm going to allow those pieces to make a, to make a project. That's what OMA does. That's what Vallejo Leduc does. That's force. Or do I want to look at ways that things have already been successful? I want to extract out, the, the patterns from those things, and I want to reapply those patterns into a new situation. What's my team approach? 
And then the pieces are all the same. We don't, we don't radically change the football game. We're always going to have the ball. We're going to have the same techniques, but they're going to look really different depending on how my superstructure is set up. Mm-hmm. Architectural design is a football game. That's a nice right? Because it's human and all human interactions are based on the same cognitive processes. Yeah. Okay, every dynamic situation works in the same way. Mm-hmm. It's, there's no point trying to predict or trying to work out fixed approaches when the whole point is that we can mix and match things. But what we should be paying attention to is the fundamental skill building and the overall structural approach. And once we have those two things, we, we like, so if I want, if I, you know, if I want to do, if I want to do a project that has a very particular, but again, it's about information. If I, if I have somebody who's really interested in the materiality of a surface, I really, well, then I can start to look at that. I can put it into situations. I'm going to use the same information. I'm going to order it in a different way because I'm paying attention to a different thing. But it doesn't mean that I have to remake the project every single time. And I don't have to relearn architecture from square one every time I do a project, Mm. which is ridiculous, right? Mm. Yeah, I agree. Oh, that's uh, very nice. (laughs) (laughs) It's a weird, I know it's a weird analogy, but it's, it's, it's actually, it's actually the basis. The last book that I wrote, the one make an architecture was like, okay, why do we not have any skill training in architecture? Mm. Why do we not have like, so basically for me, that book is a training manual of football skills. Like, mm. like I can teach somebody how to kick a ball. I can teach them how to strike. I can teach them how to pass. I can teach them how to guard. Why don't we have that for architecture? Mm. And so, and that's how, that's how the Make an Architecture book came into being, where it's like, okay, I'm going to just lay out the cognitive skills that we use and then we then put them into different situations and we combine them in different ways to get different outcomes, but they're the same skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think, I think in, <laughs> in your book also state that uh, if you work with a concept based framework, uh, you will need Porsche based. You, know, you, you, you will need, yeah, you will need Porsche. You have to. Yeah, you have to, yeah. Because uh, it's not enough. Because that's what we use. It's like <laughs> it's like pretending that you're, you know, it's like pretending that you're going to play a football game, but somehow mm-hmm. you brought a flashlight. Like, why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I like flashlights. That has nothing to do with the game. Yeah. You know, Philips, uh, there's still more questions in the chat box. So um, how about this, uh, Fendi? Uh, Fendi uh, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're confused because there's so many questions and you know we expect that <laughs> <laughs> okay um, i think we will read only three uh, questions from the chat box and then everyone will be uh, submitting to me and to arina about the questions yeah. maybe philip can ask if you don't mind uh, uh philip via uh, email can we email oh. you <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry yeah. for this but i'll try to be quicker in my responses too i okay. talk a lot yes. so okay no, it's okay but you know, it's very uh, valuable for us, but if you don't mind, uh, please kindly accept our <laughs> request that sure. yeah, that we will uh, write all the uh, questions, including for the right hand here, the participant yeah, who raised uh, their hands. Yeah, but yeah. I think we can cover it if just short a uh, question. I will make it short. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> so, yeah. For- so I can do one or two word answers. How's that? Yeah. Yes. Just do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Now, uh, for the question from Gabby, um, mm. is it possible to use a pattern for pat? Oh, is it possible to use pattern based, force based, and concept based in the same in the same time in a design? Mm-hmm. Yes. Absolutely. I think you need explanation. You need oh, explanation. do you want me to go first? But I gave you the one. You already answer. mentioned before. Yeah, and you can and you can um, and it, so it's going to come down to information again. You can you can select each framework can be nested inside another and it can be mm-hmm. run parallel. And so mm-hmm. I may want to I may want to say I want to create a public space. 
I may do an analysis of existing public spaces and I pull out that pattern framework. At the same time, I may do another and may do another investigation about how people move through space, which is force based. And then I may have I may put both of those within a concept framework to say, okay, this is this is the major cultural way that I want that thing to work because I understand how people are going to interpret it. That's three frameworks, one nested inside or two parallel inside another. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so that gets much more complicated. But again, I, you don't do that early. You do that as you get more sophisticated. Yeah. Okay. But the first thing before we use the three uh, framework, we have to understand deeply. You have to that understand right? them. Yeah. That's right. You you need to understand you your foundations understand. before yes. you use them. That's the problem is sometimes uh, not only students, but also we just like, you know, a service uh, knowledge not really yeah, deep understanding yeah. okay. <laughs> next we move on okay we move on to the next one question, question more uh from maurania um so the question is about um is it is the framework a rigid thing or you can change some step on it some phase i think is steps yeah and you can you can you know, again, once you've understood it, you can manipulate them to do what you want. But the um, the frameworks are really large gestures, right? They're they're going to give you their and what they really do is that they set starting points. And like the last the last point, where we start controls where we end. And so if I start with patterns, I get a different project. If I start with forces, I get a different project. If I start with concept, I get a different. So what they do is that they just they set up they set up what type of information we want to pay attention to. And how do we use it and what tools do we use? So, you know, if I'm doing pattern, if I'm doing pattern, I'm using, I, I personally use, uh, I use uh, types of formal event abstractions and I use comparative, comparative case study analysis. That's how I do pattern. I'd never use comparative case study analysis if I was doing forces. I'd actually do, I do physical experimentation where I'd actually start to manipulate those forces to think about how, vis I probably work in perspective, you know, a section I'd look at where and how I allow connections between things. So mm -hmm. the tools, the framework often selects the tools. That's the advantage of it. And what it is, is just about clarity, right? Mm -hmm. Once you've got them down, you, you can mess with them. If, because we're, as formal designers, we're pragmatists. We make stuff work. And as long mm -hmm. as it works for us, we don't have to question it. Mm -hmm. But it would always come to the end of the project. It'd be it's a question of relevance and significance. Is what is if I did it like this, does it give me a more relevant outcome? Yes, great. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, then change it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Philip. Uh, uh, wait, uh, Bufendi. Uh, uh, I want to clarify about something, Philip. Uh, that you said that we can use the three frameworks together, right? But yeah. once again, I think we have to state that which one is dominance and which one is the supported. Because sometimes yeah. we yeah, we, we, we have to state that because it's not yes, you do. You know, yeah. Okay. That's the point, right? Absolutely. So you, okay. Because you have to start, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Okay. You can't start at all three at the same time because you just end up with a mess. Yes. You have to you have to but what once you've started, you can then run sub projects inside mm -hmm. the larger one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh Bufendi? Uh, it has we been... continue like quickly so that we can we 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 doesn't have to bother uh, plo uh Philip after this <laughs> so we can run through it like quickly. Just, go. And then Just keep going. I'm trying I'm trying to keep my answers quicker too. So okay, yeah. okay. Thank you, Bufendi. <laughs> Please help me to then, translate the Indonesian yeah. question. Yeah. So next question is I think is the most common questions from architecture students. So usually ideas like uh, interesting ideas comes near the deadline. So she's asking <laughs> how can <laughs> they, uh, how can students find good ideas, interesting ideas before the deadline coming? <laughs> so you're not going to like my answer. Um, architecture doesn't need interest in ideas to be good architecture. Mm -hmm. And that's the bias that that's a cultural bias that we have. And that's because you, I actually, I actually, I believe that concept actually produces some of the weakest architectural outcomes, really good architects generally work through forces. And so they allow the site, the client, the user, the context, the program, they allow those things you don't need either external information nor a big idea to do really good architecture. And if you take a look historically at really fantastic pieces of architecture that stand the test of time and stand, and stand adaptive reuse, 
you realize that they're really based on a series of very, very simple social, motor, sensory, and environmental types of information, right? Okay. And so mm -hmm. I think the fallacy is, is thinking that you need an idea to do design work. You don't, not in architecture. You do in other design disciplines. So if I'm doing graphic design, I absolutely have to have an organizing concept, but in architectural design, I don't need it. Mm. Mm. Okay. And that's, that's yeah. the problem. Don't look for the big idea. Do start with forces, start analyzing the context, start looking, looking about how those, how those types of occupation of space associate with each other. How do they presence? How should they be seen? And then start to layer in the secondary information. All right. Mm. Okay. Next, uh, from the same students, um, she's asking um, whenever she, sometimes she feel like uh, she failed to translate idea into sketch. Um, and uh, this failure makes her worried that the, her design is not that good. So how to find a good design or a good idea, sorry, good idea, so that <laughs> she can avoid those failure. Right, if you can't visualize it, if you can't represent it in form and within spatial composition, it's not architectural. Okay. And so find another, <laughs> find, find. but again, it comes back to the fact that I think it depends on what that idea is. My, my gut feeling is that it's an issue of translation. It's an issue of not understanding how it has a formal effect, which means that you, it's an issue of force, force, uh, a force relationship. So how does that non-formal thing have a formal response? And that's a practice in the end, that's the bread and butter of architectural design. You have to be really good at it. You have to practice it. You have to constantly look around you and think about how something that's not physical has a physical effect, right? COVID is an architectural response. What happened to everybody, right? Six feet apart. The masks on our face are not architectural, but the position of the body within space is architectural. And understanding that those are actually not the same type of information, right? So that, now I can deal with breath, but not by a mask. I would deal with it in air current, right? Proximity, um, anything to do with that becomes an architectural moment because then I can start to interrupt airflow with objects and forces and I can change the way uh, that flow moves and space moves. Now it becomes architectural, right? And so we'll end up with a series of things that don't have stickers on the floor, but we'll, you know, if we were still in this situation hundred years from now, all of our spaces would be radically different simply because of proximity and airflow. Those are forces. Do I need a big idea to do that? No, I don't, because that's, well, in a way, what we're doing is that we're using those two to organize all the rest of the information. So that becomes a conceptual position. Okay, I promise I'd be quicker and I wasn't, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, now our next question is about uh, translating the idea sometimes. Um, is uh, you mentioned that the ideas should be translated um, into something that is understandable, whether it is relevant or not relevant in architecture, but how to justify the relevancies of uh, those translation? <laughs> That's a great question. And it's, um, I can't answer it, right? And so it's because it's context-based question. So mm -hmm. how do we determine that something is relevant, that it has an effect? Um, that it has an agreement. And ultimately, this is, this is the thing that even though a lot of almost everything we do is sensory motor and environmental and social, we ultimately, we ultimately have success on, um, on things that are social constructs. And so if, if what we do allows people to do what they want to do in that space more successfully, then, then that's relevant, right? Can I determine that ahead of time? No, it's project by project. It's, it's context by context because it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. But we should be looking for that. We should be, we should be, talking, we should be talking about relevancy, right? How does, how does a space have a relevancy to the type of events that take place within it? That's the human connection. Okay. okay. Well, next, um, <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm running. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, next question is about um, prioritizing the information. You mentioned that uh, we should prioritize the information uh, and it is related to the approach. So could we call it approach? If Could we call it as an approach if we already um, prioritize an information to our design? 
if you're doing that, you're doing concept. Ah, okay. Mm. If you're pre-selecting, if you're pre-selecting an approach, that's that's a concept frame, framework. Now, the next question would be, what other types of information will then support that? And then that's the secondary, that's the secondary level of, of method, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And there's nothing, there's, so there's nothing wrong with any of this, right? Of course you can do that, mm -hmm. but your project may suck. Mm -hmm. You may have chosen something that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I think I think I could not translate anymore, but there are too many questions. Yeah, there's too many <laughs> questions, <laughs> Philip. You know, I'm um, not answering them by email. It'll be yeah. like three days of writing to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah just, so. just answer it in your uh, free time. We don't, we, we, yeah. we are rushing it. Yes. I didn't. So I run five programs. I don't have much free time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do really know. <laughs> yes. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's the end, right, Boo Fendi, but, um, I would like, I don't know it's it's right or not, but I would like to take the conclusion. And, you know, I read your uh, new book in 2020 uh, and uh, I will cite one, uh, some sentences that I really like. I don't know, it's uh, uh, represent your presentation today, but here uh, I found some interesting sentences that when we consider architecture in this way, which is uh, in the previous line, there is a good place to start is ourselves. And our engagement in our environment has shaped the way we think, which we in turn use to the shape the environment. I think yeah. that's in your introduction, uh, in your new books. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, time is up, uh, Philips, because we still have, I think, 30 minutes left. It's okay for the lecturer, sure. 30 minutes. Uh, it's all for students, Philips. So. Uh, we would like to say thank you again, uh, Philip, for the important and interesting talks and to audience for active participation. And hopefully today's lecture will be beneficial for everybody. And uh, I hope, uh, Philip, uh, you will kindly accept our invitation again if <laughs> we send the invitation <laughs> next time. <laughs> okay. And, um, okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your intention. Uh, I will close uh, this meeting for today. And I'm sorry for uh, the one who raised the hands that not uh, allowed to ask the question, but we will try our best uh, yeah, to connect your question to Philips. If you have a free time, of course, Philips. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I think it's the end. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.